Kiora, Kiorana, Maloelei, Talofalava, Namaste, Salam Alaikum, and very warm welcome to you and everyone joining us here in this Moments That Matter series brought to you by the Waitakabi Ethnic Board with the uh, very, very uh, uh, welcome support of Foundation North, uh, Altura Academy, and uh, my wonderful guests who join me here each week as we head on through over the course of this uh, six week series. I'm so very, very pleased to be uh, bringing these, uh, this to you over the course of um, these days. So the whole concept behind this particular series is we want to do something to be able to support all of the communities, the uh, ethnic communities, the migrant communities from Waitakere all the way up to Northland, uh, right to the far north. Um, however, we want to help everybody. It's not just these particular communities as well. Over the course of these sessions, we're talking around kindness, empathy, um, uh, mental health, well-being, wellness, resilience, uh, mindset, all sorts of things, things that we would often call the soft skills, but in actual fact, they're, they're the skills that we require on an absolutely daily basis to ensure that we are succeeding at our potential. And of course, in times like this, as we are navigating our way through COVID, uh, it's also extremely important that we focus on how we're tracking through the world. So hopefully this series is an opportunity to be able to take stock of where you are currently and what you can do for yourself and for the people around you to ensure that you've got this continual push, continual growth, and that you are succeeding in every way and shape and form that you can. We have a, a wonderful range of guests over the course of uh, the, uh, the next five episodes, but of course, coming up very, very shortly indeed, uh, we're very pleased indeed to be bringing to you uh, Filippo Levi, who's a uh, now a leadership coach, but he's had an incredible career in international rugby, a former captain uh, for Manu Samoa, uh, uh, working uh, all around the world, uh, playing at the World Cup in 2011, uh, had a uh, significant career in Japan, uh, and now is using all of those skills to bring the uh, concepts of leadership and all of the work that he's done over many years uh, to fruition and to support uh, various communities. Um, not only from a commercial sense, but also uh, he's an incredible philanthropist as well and very, very strongly focused on community. And I'm very, very pleased to have him here with me in the, well, I say in the studio, but he's beaming in live. So um, a very warm welcome to our guest here, Filippo Levi. Filippo, talofa, nice to have you here. It's talofa. Um... Yeah, thank you, Greg, for the introduction. Uh, very kind words. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, we'll probably probably put it out to the world. Uh, Filippo and I um, share a particular association. We're both in the Professional Speakers Association of New Zealand, uh, which is where I came to know Filippo and uh, got to uh, chatting with him only pretty recently, I've got to say. Uh, so it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to get to know him better. Uh, and uh, it seems that we have uh, an ethos in, in that we share, which is a, re a really wonderful thing, which is how we track through the world and how we care for our communities, which is a really valuable thing. Um, so the way that this session is going to work is uh, Filippo and I will probably have a little chat here at the front end, and uh, then I'm going to re release uh, Filippo to uh, speak with you directly, uh, and uh, then we'll come back at the conclusion. And hopefully we'll be able to connect with you. Um, please feel free to fire through from Q&A onto the, uh, the webinar. And if you're watching this on Facebook Live on either my site or over the course um, uh, on the uh, Waitakere Ethnic Board site, feel free to put some comments there. I'll be bouncing backwards and forwards between those various websites and we'll see how we go. So, Filippo, um, I'm going to take you right back. Where, so, so tell me about your heritage. Where, where are you from? Where were you born? What's, uh, uh, and, and tell me a little bit about your childhood. Well, yes, well, well interesting. We're going to start off. Actually, my talk starts off, starts off from my origins. So I'll just give you a bit of a bit of a uh, insight of where I've come from. So <laughs> it uh, doesn't uh, all the uh, surprise when I talk. <laughs> it's my uh, as most uh, migrant families uh, from the Pacific. We your parents came from um, Samoa, and they uh, raised us here. So I guess as a um, a migrant child of uh, migrant parents who came here through. 
uh, the late 60s. Uh, they came to New Zealand for uh, for many things, uh, which I'll uh, I'll discuss later on. So that, that's my background. Parents uh, came here in the 19, late 1960s, uh, searched for those opportunities, and here I am, 40 odd years later, uh, um, you know, reaping the the so-called benefits because of their sacrifices, which I will talk about. Um, so that's a wee bit of my background. So uh, when my parents did come, they sort of met around Wellington uh, and then uh, floated around and father were married and father uh, ended up in the job in the railways and moved across the North Island to Huntley. And then we landed in Glen Ellis. So, so, so that's where my sort of journey started. A lovely uh, snapshot there, uh, Filippo, of your uh, of your of your journey. Um, it, it, interesting kind of thing, isn't it? Where as uh, when we grow and we move, and and we're at the whim of our parents to a great extent, right? So whatever is required, wherever we've got to go for work, wherever we're going to go for family, uh, we're brought along, and our experiences then shape us. Uh, and and we always have this tendency to potentially look back and go, what could have been different? What might have happened if we'd, if we'd stayed in another particular region where we would, where, mm. what, what might have happened? And of course, you can never, you can never know that for a fact and, and you can never have any kind of regret about um, what, what may have happened or grown. But you have had, uh, by uh, what I think most people would consider uh, a phenomenal life and a phenomenal career. I mean, some of this, you know, to aspire to playing international rugby is something that a vast majority of people aspire to and dream about, but not everybody actually manages to achieve it. Uh, so with, with that, um, I would love to know your, uh, and you're probably gonna talk with us about it in your talk as well. So again, I don't want to preempt anything, any of <laughs> your, <laughs> the elements, um, but I will ask you this, in all of your career, in, t in terms of the work that you've done around the world, um, what would be one of your high points because there's probably too many to think of. Um, I guess uh, you know, um, looking back at the sacrifices uh, that my parents uh, took, uh, and a lot of it comes down to their faith. So a lot of their what I talk about today is sort of the the values based uh, culture that we have, and that's the drive. Yes, my parents have to provide a, a, a easier pathway for their children. Uh, however, when you're Trying to be a rugby player, uh, the pathway is littered with bodies <laughs> and uh, also barriers. So, I guess it's really it's not really up to you uh, what, what your drivers. But also, what's important for me were so many people that supported me. So I don't think of myself as being success. I'm only only the success the success because of others who. I've given their time to volunteer to coach me from a you know from a eight year old uh, all the way to even now I'm still being coached by <laughs> other coaches because I'm now I'm gone to the coaching sports and um, also speaking so I'm still being coached and mentored so which is really important for me in terms of um, of the mindset of really you know uh, this continual uh, continually learning uh, because a lot of it comes down to the values my parents have. Of, um, of of going to places which were different to this, uh, which is very multicultural. Well, actually, it was very bicultural back in the back in the 1960s. <laughs> but um, yes, within 10, 20 years, uh, uh, things you know rapidly changed into very diverse uh, communities. Um, so, which was fantastic, I believe, for Aotearoa in New Zealand, or for many other. Uh, Different diverse groups um, from South America, South America to Southeast Asia to many places, which makes New Zealand a, a fantastic place to live in. I have to concur. I, I think my experiences probably mirror yours a little bit in terms of the growing up in what was seen very much as a bicultural nation, right? And 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 to a to a an extent even when I first arrived here and I'm immigrated here when I was three years old and 
then it really wasn't even bicultural. Uh, it, it was monocultural. So certainly I, I grew up in a little tiny town called Mangatafiri, and we had roughly 300 people probably living there, a little village, farming village. And, uh, it, you know, all the faces around were like mine, um, apart from uh, Peter and Michael Kappa. <laughs> and uh, they, they were the only two people who could claim any sort of ethnicity in, in the region. Uh, but it wasn't something that we, we didn't see race. I don't think there was any really, really in the, in a small community like that, it really wasn't a, 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 a too much of a challenge. Uh, but I lo I've loved seeing how New Zealand has grown and moved and morphed. And we have, we've gone through our challenges, definitely. And we certainly are, we continue to have challenges and we will. But I think there's a, a, a great deal more focus on uh, assimilating ourselves, but not losing our cultures. And I think that's a really big, important part of us for anyone as immigrants is really that, that we are very strongly uh, embedded in our own communities, but we must connect. We must have cross-culturalization because it's, it seems unfair to not share <laughs> the, the, the beauty that's within our cultures. And I'm on a journey of exploration in this as well. And, and on a journey of learning today uh, and, and becoming just becoming more, I think, and that's a, a, a really big thing. And what I like about your focus is is your sharing of your experiences in terms of the leadership growth and the uh, and the ability of the then that you have to take what you've learned and then pass it back to those people who who come to you for that uh, for that skill set. Um, so I'm very very keen indeed to hear what you're going to be talking about as we rock on through this particular episode. Um, so what I might do is uh, do this right now, actually, and let's um, put you out there on screen and uh, I'll sit in the background and uh, just give me a call uh, when you are ready and raring to uh, go and we'll get back into a bit of Q&A. Well, feel free to use me at any point as well if you want to make make any kind of points. <laughs> so oh, was great. To, to our guests, um, here is Filippo Levy. In the 1960s, uh, there was a huge... Um, migration from the Pacific. Also to fill the, fill the gaps in the in the so-called areas of of um, of the of the so-called blue part of uh, work. Um, so a lot of these places were factories who were looking for workers and uh, mainly cheap labor that they could source from the Pacific Islands. Hence they saw a gap in terms of uh, workforce and bodies something that we're finding now in this current uh, current um, pandemic. So my parents came up and they chose to leave Samoa. And I guess my story begins with their journey. And I like to start back with my father. My father was raised on the island of Savai'i uh, by his um, grandparents. And he was raised with a spirit stuff, which is very common in the Samoan culture where uh, many parents um, allow their uh, grandparents to after their child. So my father took a, a leap of faith in terms of leaving the island, uh, Savai, and he went to a, a college called Aveli College, which is in Apia, the uh, capital of Samoa. So the, the bus journey, there's a bit, of a bit of a journey there in terms of the ferry. Uh, it's about a couple of hours ferry from Savai to the main island, and then another uh, hour and a half on the bus to get to the to get to uh, Pia. So my father's journey begins with him taking those steps along the way. Fast forward in the time he left school, he left school, he worked in Savai and sort of the in the sort of the land and uh, titles courts, and he was a someone that walked, uh, worked with a lot of the families in terms of their land and what was happening on their farms. So it came to a point where. My father saw an opportunity to move to New Zealand, or Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the 1960s, and he took that leap of faith. So when my father came along, he was the bag. Uh, when he came across here, he met with family members, and that's when he started to to see a, a country full of opportunity. It began by his faith in terms of his ability to see something. 
uh, which he could provide himself, but more so Stanley. The economy in New Zealand was uh, thriving. Uh, work was needed in the factories um, and to provide for family, sometimes the village in Samoa, which was one of the, the drivers in terms of many Pacifica people who came from the Pacific Islands. The majority of them came from Samoa um, at first. So my father came here, and here he met my mum. My and for the same reasons, she came along uh, yet, uh, to a village of Falia Sigu, uh, which is not far from the airport. So mum was raised pretty much in the in a farm, uh, quite a big farm. Um, and uh, she loved gardening and loved a lot of um, um, farming different uh, um, um, products and produce, which was very abundant in, in the islands then. So she came along and she hopped on the so-called banana boats, which was a boat uh, that came from, from the Pacific Islands, it actually came from New Zealand, and it's uh, went around the Pacific Islands and it picked up, uh, again, bananas and other sort of um, uh, products from the Pacific Islands. And from then on, the Pacific Islanders actually got onto the, uh, to the boats and, uh, and came across to, to Aotearoa, New Zealand. So, my mum also had a reason to come here. All the again was stepping out of faith, leaving the comforts of home, of her village life, uh, which was abundant with resources, uh, very fit, uh, very happy indeed. <laughs> so many people then were relied on a lot of the manual force and manual skills, which was passed down through generations of generations of, of Samoan uh, culture. So I guess faith, and also family were, were strong drivers of uh, getting providing for the, uh, for the country. So when they left here, they saw an opportunity in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The opportunity was to go for money. They could send money uh, back to the Pacific Islands or uh, remittances. So, um, so I guess many of our people then were sending money in huge numbers uh, back to the Pacific Islands, which is something that many um, of our ethnic groups uh, do currently um, now. So one of the, when my parents uh, met here, they married eventually, and then, hello, I, I popped out. <laughs> so, and so I came along in 1979 uh, in Hartley. My father was working in the railways and he worked his way up into the railway system. So, um, and I guess he traveled around North Island and raised uh, our, uh, his, his family, our family of, of five children, and eventually settled in Plenanus when I was uh, two or three years old. And I went through the schooling system here in Plenanus, and when I was 10 years old, um, I remember my father was having discussions with family about uh, moving somewhere, and I don't know what, what it meant, but all of a sudden I found myself waking up in the middle of the woods, packing my bags and hopping in the, in the car, with dad and my younger brother. Now, I don't know where we're going, but we're going to a place called um, Dunedin. So, so father packed the bags up, uh, we hopped on, and the plan was my mother and my other siblings were to, uh, were to uh, bring in the new tenants in my, in my parents' house, and then sort of pack up and then fly down from Auckland. So they came down eventually. We ended up in a, after many hours of driving, uh, but it was fun. So I guess leaving the, the frostbites of uh, all the sort of cold mornings in Auckland to, to the winter of the data was a bit of a, a culture shock. I guess my father, like he saw an opportunity for um, himself. He wanted to leave his job. And a lot of it came down to his values. I guess his values clashed with his work, and his work uh, was really provided um, comfort. Um, uh, we were provided for. We never, well, but I was always well fed, um, and we always well looked after. So, and many sacrifices my mum made to stay home. She also worked as a Sunday school teacher and also a, a culture cultural teacher, so she used a lot of her expertise in the Samoan culture to, to teach and to keep uh, mentoring people. And, she, and she's, she also 
um, used to sell at markets. So she had quite a business mind, my mum, um, which is something that she learned from my, my dad, who ran a sort of a, a, a good business in, in the farm. Uh, it's quite funny what they used to call him, Abalangi. I'm not sure what they called him that for, but I think it's more that he, uh, he was very, not tight, but he had certain, his certain names, he knew how many hours each person worked and how much they were owed. So he was very, uh, very detailed, with this, which is something uh, that I do inherit. Um, but that's, you know, but that's that's something that's, um, uh, which, which my mum took on board. So so when my, when my parents um, went down to Dunedin, they, um, one of the drivers was, was my father to become a minister. So my father left Dunedin out of Auckland in 1990. Um, and I was still at primary school then, standard four, and leaving there to come down to Dunedin. And I guess like most migrants who leave their comforts of their countries of, um, or escaping their countries for different variety of reasons, um, uh, but very complex. Like so my father um, can, he saw things quite differently. He could see something which was driving him, and a lot of it was based on his faith. I guess his faith was based on the Christian values, which of um, of driving change, of of, of respect, of of, of service, um, you know, and also uh, in his work life and his values based system really clashed. So I guess he went down to Dunedin with a goal, and he knew he had to change his life, and that came through uh, him taking that leap of faith. As many of us diverse communities do every single day coming to New Zealand, uh, dropping the children at, at school, different schools, and, um, finding that um, there's, there's educational opportunities, which is really important and uh, for many families and for many migrant families, those are some of the reasons, or some of the reasons they are coming for the educational uh, and also the opportunities that stem from having good education. My father ended up in uh, Knox College and the uh, University of Otago. Went from then, uh, from there to learning how to um, sort of type in a computer, a big, one of those computers they used to call in the early 90, the 90s, uh, but it was quite big. Um, so, so that's the first time I, I saw a computer. So um, there were different games on there. And um, so my father went through there um, and typed. And three years later, he says so back to his degree. And theology. And from then on, that's where his journey began. You know, I could see his pathway. I could I, I could see then, okay, my father's come from the Pacific Islands. He's taken up one of the um, uh, quite a, uh, the difficult subject of theology of, of all uh, of all degrees at the study at uh, in the University of Otago. So he left to um, so he left Dunedin and he found his first uh, church role in Christchurch. Fast forward to me. So he left when he left to Christchurch. I was uh, left sort of in Dunedin to finish off my senior years. So I started with friends and I was about seventeen, uh, eighteen, and I um, eventually uh, I had a goal as well. I I liked the rank. Right, because all my friends played it, uh, but also it's something I could see as to come in all black. Uh, but also I had drivers to people Samoa, but Samoa were or Manu Samoa were a team that I looked up to when in the early 1990s, uh, when Samoa were great. Uh, and this when the times when they made uh, you know they were consistent in making the the so-called quarterfinals and semifinals. So I had a goal either uni all blacks. I don't know, I'm making the Samoa, but I'm making the Samoa team. That's okay. I'll just adapt and and I'll you know just play for play for someone else that I can, um really sort of uh, give my best. In. So I left school. I went to university, and that was a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a struggle going from uh, high school to university. Because one thing I knew was that I was um but I liked I like small groups. I like uh, 10, 15 uh, people in the class and one teacher. And but when you leave high school, when you go, go to a, a lecture theatre, about 500, 600 students, uh, you really. So I guess 
a lot of things had to really have to change. And I really struggled that year at uni. A lot of it came down to finding a flat. Uh, also, my parents weren't there. I uh, had to really uh, find my feet and really uh, find uh, people to, you know, to help me uh, in terms of my rugby goals and, and, and club rugby, uh, but also um, also providing for my students as much as I can, but with a very limited funds <laughs> you get as a student. Um, so I had to do the old, old jobs and, and, and it's something you need to do, you know, you need to, um, to, you know, to be, to be able to be um, that word, uh, uh, you know, which is a story that, I'll, um, uh, that I find really, uh, you know, competent of, of adapting, of seeing sort of theories and then, oh no, this doesn't work, I'm going it this way. So I guess it's by, it's by learning by, by doing, and it's a very, I guess, for a lot of sports people, it's what we do, we learn by doing, and it's a, probably a male thing, uh, because you like to do it first, if you make a mistake, and a lot of the, uh, uh, won't be, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, athletes that I've coached, mainly uh, girls I used to coach in schools, uh, you know, I, I found them um, much more skillful than males. So that's not a, that's <laughs> not a stereotype. That's something that I've experienced in different, uh, different genders, uh, males and females. So I guess for males, was to get in there, uh, make a mistake and, and go from there. So eventually I, um, I made the, the New Zealand team uh, after a few years of struggle. And the New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand under one team. So I guess I'll hold up one of the jerseys I had. So that's one of the jerseys, the silver fern there, one of the jerseys that I was able to achieve. Uh, and one of the, um, and, uh, and I guess part of that is also making my parents proud. And it was never easy because again, it's a lot of my values were based on, um, on um, uh, the collaboration with others who can help me, who can drive me forward, uh, who could uh, give me feedback, who could, you know, it's really small things that I, that I really, uh, that I really like, and a lot of the detail things that I, uh, you know, sometimes miss <laughs> and need to be reminded of, because I guess that's part of your, your, your learning process of, of getting feedback and getting the feedback loop. So I'm grateful to um, to wear this jersey with, 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 with pride, because wearing the, the New Zealand jersey, as a 21 year old, I was a 20 year old back then. And it was, it was a step to the to the next uh, goal was to become an All Black. And I guess I also had motor sound all this. So, so the opportunities that were given to me by my parents, moving from Samoa to Auckland to Auckland to Dunedin, and then a lot of it was, was being, was being um, you know, a lot of the sort of took the fruits of their, of their hard labor sacrifice. Which is something that many of our my group families are going through right now. So, at the moment I, I live I in uh, my, my street, I'm, I live in a very diverse uh, area called Glenanus, and there's many different uh, ethnic groups in this area. And and next to me is this family from uh, Afghanistan. So, I'm learning some of their names, which is very difficult learning a uh, different uh, language, uh, but also different uh, uh, names. We uh, you know, you want to get the vowels right because it's all in the vowels. It's all in those, those very specific details. And so, so I, I can see their journey from Afghanistan as as a family that has left a, a country which is which is rebuilding. Um, you know, after a very difficult time of, you know, of decades of war um, and coming to New Zealand, um, you know, for different opportunities. So it's good to know, understand wee bits of what they're going through. And I can see my parents, even though there wasn't any warfare in Samu, uh, maybe probably through families, <laughs> but um, you, 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 you admire, admire many of the um, migrant families coming from, uh, from areas which are war torn areas to see these opportunities. So one of the take, take ones, well, something that you can take from my talk today is uh, the hard work and sacrifice that you're doing now you know, the fruits of your labor will come out for 30, 40 years later when your children do go to university. Because through my father's sacrifices, you know, I was able to go to university. And behind me are uh, a, a couple of degrees that I'm, I was, um, you know, grateful to have support from my, from, from my peers and through lecturers who mentored me, supported me from my journey of trying to become a uh, you know, a graduate, and it was really tough. Uh, 
playing for different teams and one of the teams I played for um, down in Dunedin was was um, was this team was yeah, a Tiger team. So this is the jersey against the British Lions. So number four. And so as I'm going to university, I'm trying to focus on, on my off-field uh, career of becoming the best player I can be. And so, um, so, you know, so these jerseys are holding a little dear because they come through, uh, not through me, but they come through many coaches, teachers in Dunedin uh, and Auckland, also Auckland and junior grades who supported me in their journey uh, to becoming who I am. And for many of our Mungo families who face a, a multitude of, of issues through language barrier, through different cultures in New Zealand. And I know many migrants who come here have not seen a Samoan before, <laughs> or Polynesians, because they come from very monocultural countries. And, um, and again, I when I finished my career in, in, in Dunedin uh, at Otago, and I eventually finished my, uh, my first degree, uh, which a degree takes about three years, um, but mine took about six years. Well, actually, probably seven years. <laughs> um, so again, I was always, you know, um, thinking about my dad. He took three years, so uh, I guess I actually doubled score. So, um, but the, the main thing is, it's it's not where you, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Eventually, when I did finish my uh, bachelor's, I ended up uh, getting accepted in my master's degree. Eventually, the last uh, two years of my degree, I my grades started to pick up to the B pluses to the A's, and eventually I found my um, myself, uh, you know, supported by, you know, very passionate lecturers, uh, like uh, lecturers such as uh, Brendan, uh, uh, sorry, Professor Brendan, uh, also had other lecturers such, such as Dr. Michelle Shaif, also, Dr. Matani Shaif, who supported me through my journey, also Judy Singer, a cousin of mine. So a lot of these teachers supported me on my journey because, again, I had to balance uh, the rugby life by, um, and also going to be a student. I always had that drive to, you know, how you start, it's how you finish. So, and I always had the drive. So uh, usually your master's degree take about, takes about one year, but I ended up talking about four and a half years, so it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. And I guess one of those, most of those years were, were in the, my final year, I completed it in Japan. I ended up in Japan up in Islanders for, uh, for about six years. Um, and then moving to Japan. Even for me, moving to Japan was like, okay, do they speak English here? Uh, very limited. <laughs> or as they say in Japan, uh, uh, football, football, football. And, um, you know, um, in terms of their language. So, again, I had to learn a language and I had to um, relearn to unlearn and to learn um, again a different culture. And what I found in the Japanese culture was, again, was uh, different, was very uh, aligned to a lot of my values of respect, of a lot of uh, values of family, uh, of, of also their values based. Leadership module uh, models, which is very similar to Samoan um, leadership model of servanthood, or they call in Samoa Tautua. So, a lot of that I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the tradition in the culture and the understanding the different diversity um, from my team members who were in my team and some of my friends who came to, to Japan. So some of the, I guess, uh, for me going to Japan was a challenge. Um, many migrant people come to New Zealand have to relearn uh, English uh, or Kiwi English, which is, very, which is very different to what you hear on the TV. And so again, so learning these different, sort of very different um, cultural um, slangs, as you say them, and, um, and also these challenges uh, but also the opportunities to uh, to learn different things uh, and also to provide those values from your countries um, and bring them to Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. So I spoke about my parents coming from, from the Pacific. 
yourselves who are watching this webinar uh, probably have come from different uh, countries, different uh, religions. They've come in search of these um, of opportunities of the economy, of education, of providing for your families and your communities back in um, back in your back in your countries. So what I say to you is that your sacrifices now and your hard work that you're doing every day to provide for your for your children, you will see those you will see the fruits of your labor, your labor, and because of the values that you bring into this country, as well, a lot of the values of servanthood, of the um, relationship, are based on philosophies that you have. Something that we can add a lot of value to Aotearoa New Zealand and our communities. And I guess in Samoa we have a model for the Fono Fale, which is um, created by um, Enderman. He created this model based on the Samoan concept of well being. So, well being talks on uh, the values based um, module in terms of our physical health our mental health, our, also our faith, uh, also our, our communities. All of these, if you look at a building, these four walls, uh, so-called four walls surround an, uh, an individual, the individual is surrounded by other, by their family, by the communities. So our values-based leadership, I believe, is something that's needed in Aotearoa New Zealand right now. We have trust factor in our communities, which is, the, which is one of the foundations of who we are. Faith is, is something of who we are and how we can provide by giving, by serving, by servanthood. Also, how we interact with different people. Step out of faith, learn a different culture, learn a different uh, a name, understand others. And, and ask questions of you know of, of different people, um, and also um, be bold and, and go into different webinars, and learn from different um, different people. Don't even learn from me, but you can learn from another person. Because I guess being a Samoan, my experiences would be very different. Uh, Samoan from Samoa or Samoan from Australia, a Samoan from America, like the Rock, very different. Uh, also, I'll be very different experiences to a Tongan uh, who was raised here. Uh, also, a Tongan from Wamaru in Dunedin, not far from Dunedin, uh, which has probably the, the highest population per capita. Some of the people in New Zealand, Aotearoa, is a Wamaru, <laughs> which is an interesting fact. So, I guess again, they see opportunities in the South Island, providing, uh, as, I, as again, as I mentioned today. So your values-based uh, values uh, philosophies really work. We don't really work. They they are one of the the drivers for for who we are as our communities. So whether you're in Waitakere, uh, further north, and smaller communities, a lot of your values-based model um, philosophies are things that we know that they drive us every day. You know your service, your relationships, your trust, uh, your your faith. Uh, and your religion is all part of who we are as communities, how we can help everyone in your families, in our communities, to build our community together. We've heard the words of uh, Jacinda Ardern, our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, to be kind, to be empathetic, because these times are challenging us as a nation of pandemic crisis. Take those values you have, be kind, be kinder, work together, so we can bring everyone together and achieve success. I've said to the lover, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, kia ora, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Filippo. Uh, a a whistle-stop tour through your life and your uh, experiences. Uh, I, what I'm really looking forward to doing is sort of unpacking some of uh, those experiences as well and, and some of the learning that you've picked up as you've travelled through your life. Uh, I, I just sort of took from that, you know, that element of having to assimilate into multiple cultures 
over the course of um, your life and career uh, is is an incredibly challenging thing. And I think for our audience, particularly, there's a lot of synergy between your experiences and what people are going through now. And particularly for an immigrant community, when you when you come to uh, this country or when you get, get go to any country, you you have to make it right. There's no there's no two ways about it because you are you know, you've got a, a lot of pressure uh, to succeed. Uh, there isn't any fallback position. Uh, so was was that was there a sense of that in your childhood as you grew that 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 this was uh, your, for your parents coming to this country they had to make it. No, oh, of course. I mean that uh, you know they had to take a leap of faith to leave the comforts of a very monocultural society of just someone only. <laughs> That's all you see, someone only. <laughs> and I guess coming into transitioning into Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, uh, was very challenging. And for most migrants, they, they try to find that sort of that uh, the epicenter of their comfort zone or, or their safe safe place. And many, for many migrants, uh, for Pacific Samoan, the epicenter was uh, was the church. So the church provided the stability, provided the culture, provided the traditions from from the homeland, life in a different city, and also able to live their their values, their values in terms of their Samoa, which is their Samoan culture. So. That was a bit of a, for many migrants, they would see their temple, their mosque, uh, you know, the um, you know, many, uh, many religions they find as a city. They will go there because it provides the values that they to be brought up in, in the country, uh, to also pass it on to, to their children. So, for me, for my story, I'm, I'm trying to as clear as I can. There's many other things in there as well. I've lived in a lot of many countries. Uh, I used to live in Wales after Japan, and I thought Wales uh, only spoke English. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> um, very, very proud so, culture. Very Sorry? Proud cult a very proud culture, uh, the Welsh. Oh, very. Uh, so I, again, learn, uh, I, I learned their, uh, you know, their... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the accents and also some of the questions or or phrases they used to tell me here. Uh, I was trying to un un understand what they were saying. So one of them was one of the words I just I was trying to get for a long time was but but right right. So so this um, so in my head I'm thinking are they asking me a question or are they asking me am I okay? So they're saying you're right but. So, I'm not sure if they're talking about my butt, but my big butt. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not too sure. It wasn't until later on, a few weeks later, that I understood what it meant. So, so I said, but was, uh, hey, but, uh, I said, but was, was buddy. Was just a very, <laughs> very, uh, it was, was taken from buddy. So it's it more like, it's more like, you know, you're here and I'll get a new zealand book. Hey, hey. Hey man, uh, you know those sort of words. Um, so, but uh, but also you're right. You're right. So that's another. I wasn't too sure if that was a question or of asking me, am I okay? So you're right. Is like, are, are you okay? Sometimes just a gesture. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so, <laughs> and then I and then I had to. I was there for six months, and then I went from there to to Newcastle. <laughs> Complete difference, but very much the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> very much the same. As, again, didn't have a clue of, of who was what they were saying up in the, up in the Geordie land. Uh, so I was there for two years. Uh, learned a few few Geordie uh, Geordie slangs and and uh, a bit of Geordie culture. And I guess that's part of my experiences. I, I, I love to to do, um, to experience uh, different people and different cultures and and having fun doing it and and learning. You know, learning because it's not always about Maybe Samoa, no. Samoans are the only ones in the world. Oh, no. <laughs> We're only about probably a couple hundred thousand of us in the world. Uh, but there's, uh, there's a multitude of multi, uh, diverse uh, universe, universe or, or world we live in. Uh, and it's a very global part of this uh, global society or as a global citizen. And it's my responsibility to understand others 
uh, where they come from, uh, what are their values, uh, how can I help them? Can I learn different from my upbringing of what of, of what they do? And try to you know to understand my 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 mindsets and so those are some of the some of the things. Thanks. I had a couple of questions um, come in from our audience, and I thought I'd just share these with you. And um, the, fir the first of these is actually from our next week's guest who's going to be joining us. I'll tell you more about her uh, later on in the show. Uh, but the first question from um, from Danny is: is what, At what age did you start playing rugby? How old were you? I played ooh, when I was probably eight years old. Eight years old. So I, I played. So in Auckland, I played for a club called Tamaki, Tamaki Rugby Club, and I only, I only got to play because my father, because I cried because my brother was playing, and I thought I was, I was crying because I thought it was unfair. Uh, so you can start making And uh, but back then, uh, you know, uh, my, my father was very strict. He was very religious. You know, very you can't do this. You can't play on Sundays. Uh, when we went to Dunedin. I started to play Sundays. I used to sneak out of the house to play Sundays, <laughs> and, and I guess my father, through his, through his, um, his training, through the theological uh, or you know, they actually gave him you know a different, actually a different world view of, of what it means to, to for different people and what their Sabbath is or what they see him as holy. Or so I guess that's. Uh, I don't want to talk about theology. But I'll leave it to the. To the but I just tell you so. I started eight years old, uh, and then I sort of went against my father's values. Uh, but then he changed his values, and then I, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, and I'm still playing. I, I played um, against the, the former All Blacks uh, in a show called Match Fit. Uh, it was it was did last night on TV Three. So if you can watch me play. Uh, uh, go to the TV Three app, and you'll see me playing. And it's still playing. <laughs> Um, what actually? What differences have you found uh, over the years in terms of your physicality? Uh, obviously, you know you've had a, certain, a number of injuries over the course of your career as well. Uh, but uh, I know look, I'm 51 uh, now, and I'm certainly feeling it's challenging to maintain a level of fitness, and it's challenging to you know you, you sort of feel the aches and pains, the creaks and the groans happening in your various uh, uh, muscles and bones. How are you finding it? it has the, your rugby career had a significant impact on your body? And, uh, and what does that bode for the future? Yes, I guess it's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very blessed with my, with my Samoan genes, with my mom's genes and dad's genes. Uh, uh, very big bones, so uh, you know. So I'm always always blessed with those so-called the DNA sort of, uh, um, you know, from, from my parents uh, through the Polynesian gene. Um, however, you know, I still have injuries. I had a few old surgery on my arm with uh, with my nerve, which was trapped in my in my, uh, my left elbow. So I had to have surgery again. Uh, if I didn't have surgery, I would have lost the the feelings of my of the finger here, my little finger, and the nerve that runs down here. So I got a big scar here, which was cut about three, well, four years ago. So that came from a lot of uh, wear and tear, uh, a lot of heavy weights, a lot of tackling over over 13 years of, of playing professional rugby. So I guess yeah, so some injuries here. Yeah, I, I do get the odd injury. Uh, and playing in the game against the Formal Blacks, I was in the bed for about a week. <laughs> so uh, I guess that, uh, you know, I guess the, 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 the mind's still going, you know, but the body ain't. <laughs> the body slow down, slow down. Um, however, my my wife is a uh, is, is a health and wellness expert, so I I have to listen to my wife now. So she so she tells me to eat this, uh, go train. She, she bought me a bike during the lockdown, uh, the first lockdown. I only just put it together like two weeks ago. So now I'm starting to bike around the area and uh, you know just to maintain my fitness levels. We have a dog. I take a I take a walk. Uh, when I when I can, <laughs> always the dog's very energetic. Uh, so and he, you know, so making sure that uh, that my that my my physical health and my mental health, because being physically fit or physically healthy, really provides for that, you know, for that um, well being in terms of um, you know, of of my health as a as a person. 
I think it's one of the challenging things that we've had over the course of this year, particularly through the lockdowns, is that uh, uh, the element of mental well-being. Mm. Um, and it's it's been challenging. I mean, for me personally, it's been challenging. You know, a, lo a lot of ups and downs and, and uh, uncertainty that goes with it. Um, but particularly, I think, for our communities that we're broadcasting to, uh, you know, the, the level of uncertainty, um, the the potential challenges in work opportunities uh, have, have, have definitely have an effect, not only mentally, but of course, you know, from a financial standpoint um, as well. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to come to that in, in, a, in a short moment. It was sort of talking. I would like to talk to you about some. Um, mental skills, perhaps, or or uh, focus that we can that we can do to keep on keep us moving through. But let's, uh, another question come through for on the Zoom um, call, uh, which is this: in terms of the you know the work that you've done around the world and moving to various cultures, the question is: did you feel richer emotionally from living in other countries? Is diversity and being open to other cultures and beliefs a good thing for New Zealand, or is it frightening? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, can, uh, I just talk about my, my journey from living uh, from Glen Innes. So Glen Innes is, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, Glen Innes was a very, uh, was a very Maori and Pacific community. So it was pretty much brown <laughs> in, the, in, in Glen Innes, Auckland. So, so for about eight, nine years, uh, coming from uh, coming to Auckland, I lived here and it was very, uh, just very Sabo and that's what, that's what I was surrounded with, uh, a lot of Polynesian people. Um, and so I went from here to Dunedin. Again, I asked myself, where are the Samoans? <laughs> so, which in Dunedin, which is pretty much 99% uh, European, or 99.97%, I don't know. But it was a very, uh, let's just say very, uh, so I've gone from one extreme, very Polynesian-based uh, community, to to Dunedin, which is a very uh, monocultural uh, community. However, there were uh, pockets of, of of history of of, of Chinese migrants, which I I started to learn about through a lot of the, uh, the guys I went to high school with, uh, the Tin family. Um, so a lot of these families, the, the Turner family, uh, so a lot of families who already generations. Uh, the second or third generation families in, in Dunedin. So I got to understand and unpack a lot of the history of, of Dunedin and the, and, the, and the migrants, the Chinese miners who came, many uh, in, the, in Europe, they pretty much came down to the gold rush in the, in the South Island uh, in search of uh, you know opportunity and also search for hope. Oh. So going down there, um, kind of challenging, and I guess that's part of who I am, uh, adapting to uh, different uh, environments, adapting to conditions, Adapting to different cultures, it's not it's not it's not easy. You know, you have to be uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, you have to ask the uh, odd silly question. If you don't ask the silly question, then how else are you going to learn? You know, it seems silly to you, but for them, they're probably thinking, "Oh wow, this guy wants to know about me. They want to know about my culture." Um, so, and then, and then when I started to move around the world with uh, the Highlanders to South Africa, to you know, to Playing for Samoa, going to Tonga, again, very different to Samoa culture, to Fiji. Again, uh, you know, something I studied at university were, was the um, uh, was the uh, the Indian who came to uh, to Fiji in the 1800s or early 1900s through uh, through the through the through the British. So again, there's history there, and again, understanding that for university because it's something they don't teach your high schools. They don't teach you about the about the uh, uh, the indentured uh, labourers uh, who were brought in by the by the, by the so-called British, um, uh, you know, the British, um, um, British authorities back then. Mm. So I guess so understanding that and understanding cultures really, um, yeah, makes me makes me learn what to learn uh, other people and how history is formed and different uh, empires in the Pacific. That's something I've just learned sort of recently about uh, different. Uh, uh, different um, sort of uh, empires in the Pacific, uh, many, and there were, and also, you know, going from there to Japan, uh, Wales to 
um, to Newcastle. And then I went to Nottingham as well. So Nottingham and in the, in the Midlands for about the season. So yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's been all and understanding and also coming back here and understanding that New Zealand altered or we are changing. Uh, I read a statistic I, I read a few months ago. I think it was Paul Spoonley, my participant, uh, you know, highlighted I don't know that the, that the statistics for Auckland in the next 30, 40 years is going to be 30, 40% Polynesian, about 30, 40% uh, Southeast Asian. So we're going to have a very uh, diverse uh, Auckland. So I guess if you haven't accepted that this is going to change, well, you get accepted because it's changing uh, currently. And I guess with those different cultures mixing with the New Zealand culture, uh, and also understanding that we have a treaty and, and a bilateral relationships, which is the founding fund, the foundation of, of Aotearoa, of the treaty or, or, or what I Understanding those stories, people, because so many people understand it, especially a lot of Pacific people who come here to New Zealand, they don't really understand the, the treaty of what But also, again, a lot of us haven't been taught at the high schools in New Zealand. So we're going through a stage where we are learning our history in the future, it's, 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 I think it's, I'm very optimistic about the future and the way the government's going with uh, keeping us safe and providing pathways for different migrant groups to come here because it's, it's the so -called, um, it is the so-called, um, um, the so-called milk and honey uh, New Zealanders, that's something that Pacifica people saw, the milk and honey of New Zealand, and that's taken from a lot of the, uh, our values from also our, our, our culture and religion. Um, so, um, so I guess for diversity and, and, and ethnic groups, you know, coming here, we are here for a similar reason and opening our minds to these different cultures is about adapting, uh, about uh, thinking, you know, about how can I learn, uh, how can I see things differently. Uh, and and I guess for many people, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and that's something about their mindsets, so having that uh, mindset to really think outside of the so-called screen we are looking at now. So you walk out and actually learn about other people. And uh, um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, but we are in the transitional phase uh, that we need to really uh, look at ways to accept everyone. I, I completely agree with you. I, we, it's a, 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 a wonderful time, I think, because we have this openness that is happening. We have a government that is uh, a, a empathetic and caring, uh, and we have an opportunity for us to be able to uh, with less fear, I think, be able to look at other cultures and, and experience the the wonderful diversity that we have here. I was very fortunate personally when I was 18, 19, um, I was working in a factory in uh, Mangari. Uh, and I, I'd been, I, I'd actually been employed by this factory uh, in the office as a, in a sales role. So I was, a, I was in with the computers and doing all the, I was having a ball, but I was also wanting to join the army. And so I put my application into the army and they said they accepted me. And I had about two or two months or so before I uh, joined. Uh, so I went to my employer and said, hey, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to join the army. And because uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to let them know that, you know, they need to find somebody else. And they said, oh, well, you know, you'll leave in about a month's time. And, uh, and I said, well, I won't have any work for a, for a month. Uh, mm -hmm. and, they, and they said, well, maybe we can find a job for you. And this was, un you know, unbelievable to me that somebody would actually want to care for me enough that they would they'd find me this work. So they made a job for me in the factory. And they put me, I went downstairs onto the main floor and I was welding uh, air conditioning units but the beautiful oh, wow. thing about it was that I was on a factory line now I had uh, three other co-workers working with me uh, there was a guy whose, I, whose only name I ever knew was Singh he was a Fijian Indian and uh, he was a, a a, a constant um, beside me he would you know keep talking keep talking keep talking a really lovely guy on my other side was a chap by the name of Phi Tran. Now he was from Vietnam and had 
uh, escaped from Vietnam. He was a Vietnamese boat person and yeah. he'd come in as a, uh, 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 for asylum to New Zealand. So he was working beside me. Uh, and then there was a, uh, a Tongan uh, chap by the name of, I think, Saul Wolfgram, I think his name was. And yeah. he wanted to be a professional boxer. And so we, the three of us on this line had incredibly <laughs> different lives and different ideals and different concepts. And the four of us got on like a house on fire and it was brilliant. And I was f learning all sorts of different things about cultures, about journeys, particularly with Fi, uh, with, with Tran, sorry. He, he was telling me all about his, um, uh, his journey and it was harrowing. 14 years old, uh, fleeing mm -hmm. under in gunfire and you're, you're not having an experience of that it's really hard to understand and certainly at a very young age for myself as well it's you know you don't have life experience to be able to really uh, assimilate it you know to understand the, the what the depth of that but over years you get to know a lot more about yourself and you get to know a lot more about that experience and I'd love to find them I'd love to find them because we're such a wonderful thing to be able to reconnect and uh, and see where our lives went. Where do, what, what did we do uh, over the course of time? So that's a bit of a mission for me. And I've been working on this in the background, actually, just trying to locate these uh, uh, individuals. But what I'd like to, uh, we, we don't have too much time left. There's a, I had got another question here, which is uh, talking about your parents. Did you find uh, that your parents struggled obviously more than you did you know, because you as a, as a youngster you're growing up in in a culture or a multicultural sort of society but for your parents uh did they struggle to adapt to the new land and culture and have their struggles possibly helped you to become more resource, resourceful or successful um but it's, um... Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, just through, just knowing, understanding their story, because now I think they talk about it, they're retired now, so they've worked most of their working lives in New Zealand and Aotearoa, New Zealand, so uh, being resourceful is one of the key drivers for a lot of media migrant families, being a very um, a pragmatic uh, kind of approach, and also adapting to different cultures. Um, you know, I haven't really interviewed them and said, hey, what was your challenges? Yes, in a way, when we, when we when, uh, Pacific people would talk, we, we, we talk in stories. So uh, when we have a, we have a concept called Taladoa, which is uh, to do with the Pacific Taladoa, which is a, which is a flow of ideas or stories in a, in a very comfortable setting, which is very psychological and safe to, to share stories. Because in stories, you get, you get to unpack and hear, um, you know, hear the struggles of, of my parents. So a lot of these, Stories my parents tell me are about living in the Pacific, are about facing challenges, are about facing racism you know, in, um, in circle places. I won't name it where they are. <laughs> so, and how they and how they approach that. And uh, my 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 father is a very uh, very calm person. He's a very calm. He's a very he's a uh, what they call him. We call him a introvert. Very introverted. Father's very introverted. He likes reading. He likes books. Uh, and he, you know he's a former so he used to preach wood. However, my mum was a bit of a lion. <laughs> so, so again, uh, you know, even though there's no lions in Samoa, <laughs> so, so, yeah. So she was very much either in terms of um, of moving things forward, of, of achieving things, of making sure my father was right halfway in. Whoever's blocking my father, good luck. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So because he's very so, uh, I think Moody, uh, one of our speakers, uh, uh, is it uh, um, Alison Mooney? Alison Mooney. Mm -hmm. Remember years ago when Alison Mooney spoke about different colors of different uh, different personalities, you know, red, uh, orange, or yellow, or and green and blue. So, if you're looking at the blue and green, which were the introverts, we're very quiet, calm, detailed people. Where the red and the orange were pretty much extroverts. Uh, and also the drivers, and also wanting to get results, and you know, so they had different uh, uh, values-based systems. So my, my so my mum was a was very was very red and, and and green, and also yellow. So she was in the, in the three. So if you're looking at a 
of a chart, so there's four colours. My title is pretty much a, a very, very, very blue and green. So, and that's probably not a, a that's not probably not a sample thing. That's quite a universal thing. <laughs> people who have different personalities, people who are introverts, extroverts. You have those who have, who combine both of them, who are so-called uh, uh, um, uh, or, 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 or ambiverts. You know, that's the term I learned years ago. So I guess, um, yeah, they they very had to be had to, uh, you know, in order to thrive in a different uh, environment. You know, they had to adapt. Uh, they had to adapt to what they had, and of course, they had challenges. As had to learn English, you know, uh, the New Zealand way. You know, there's a different way. Uh, if you're learning in Australia, again, very different. Go to America. You know, you got so you got um, these different sort of. Um, Schools they had to learn these micro schools. My my parents had to learn, so uh, I'm sure it was a challenge. And I'm one of the I'm, I'm, I've, I've taken on all um, you know their their sacrifices and, and their hard work. There's one thing they they want to see us do is to fail, because they've given us a an opportunity. But leg up, you know, will be Um So those are the values which our parents came here for for to be to be um, to be successful of them. Uh, it's, and that's something that's really drives me to be successful in speaking, <laughs> in my business speaking, and be the best I can because I see there's a gap here. Uh, there's not many sort of people who do this professionally. Actually, I can only think of two, I think. Um, so again, it's a challenge for us to give our, our confidence of our group. And uh, hey, I'm, I'm a speaker. I, I run a business. I say, oh, why are you doing that for? <laughs> I want to inspire people, empower people, and collaborate. So those are some of the words I use. So, oh, that's 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 interesting. Um, but I guess they need to understand until they actually take a leap into faith, <laughs> which I have done a few years ago. So, um, so yeah, taking those learnings, uh, taking them from my professional life as a, as a, as, a, as a professional speaker, become better to learn, uh, to adapt, to change things. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm there. I'm I'm you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm Part of my parents, I, 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 I represent them. Uh, I do. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Filippo. I, what, what I'd like, um, if you can, if you can leave us with uh, something that um, is tangible for our audience. Uh, in terms of some, perhaps some of the work that you do uh, with uh, with coaching and so forth. Uh, you, I know that you use various acronyms in uh, some of the work that you do. Is there anything that you can leave our viewers with in terms of? the situation we've got ourselves in right now um we're still powering through COVID. there's still uncertainty still challenges um what can you share with us that will uh, potentially help our audience well look i um during the COVID, uh, the first COVID lockdown i uh, sort of trying to work and trying to get some work as you do online and i came up with an acronym called uh called ace <laughs> called ace it's COVID or ace the pandemic and i I got to uh, speak on this um, on the uh, you know online uh, with Philippines, the uh, a channel called New Channel, uh, which was uh, founded by uh, the former president of the Speaker Association of Philippines, uh, Lloyd Luna. So, so I speak about uh, ACE, uh, how do you ACE this uh, pandemic and, and also the challenges. So, uh, A is uh, won't go into too much, but I'll very briefly. So, A is um, is um, at, um, uh, the adaptability. So A is one of the, the key things is, is, is how we approach this pandemic and, and this, uh, this post, well, hopefully post-COVID uh, lockdown uh, out here in New Zealand. So adapting to situations and, and it's very, in a tough environment uh, where we are. Uh, many of our families or friends have been let go of work. Uh, they have to relearn uh, different skills, to unlearn skills to to adapt and, and thrive in the new economy. So a lot of those, for example, we are talking about um, are using Zoom, uh, you know, using uh, different, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, different channels into digital platforms or how we do speakers. So that's one thing, uh, adapting to new conditions. However, for business, um, many people need to start different products. So I expect on that, how do you adapt through that? So, but also adapting for if you need to go to a, a job, how do you, Find a different, um, a different, um, you know, opportunity somewhere. Um, and 
but it's a challenge. I don't have all the answers, but I just have adaptability as something uh, mindset-wise. It's something that we, we, can, we can have and use and, and finding ways to to, uh, to help you. Uh, the second one is uh, the collaboration. So collaboration, uh, so see, I thought collaboration. Collaboration is really a key thing. So collaborating with different people who you have probably um, not networked before. So if you're in the business, finding different groups who um, you know who you can learn from or you can offer to help someone in. Um, you're not asking for any business transactions. It's it's how can you learn from others? How can you provide value to others? Um, because you know this is one a tough environment. So probably in your communities, it would be collaborating more at your at your mosque uh, or the church or the synagogue or the temple. You know how can you do more to collaborate with others? How can you provide good service? As a service uh, from uh, from a values based system, which is very about uh, you know serving others. So collaboration is really about you know how can we learn within our own cultures? How can we collaborate with others outside our culture of of comfort and learning from different people? Because when you learn from different people, uh, you know that enables you to 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 learn different things and it provides you a different you know different pathway and and, and other ways. Uh, using also using also um, social platforms, you know, you can join Facebook groups um, and uh, create your own LinkedIn uh, group, which I have, and and uh, that's something I challenge of, but if you want to join this group, <laughs> but uh, you can create your own thing, you know, you can start to collaborate with other sort of uh, like-minded people in your networks uh, on, on social media, um, if that's where you feel uh, that you can drive change as well. So the last uh, four eights, eight, and C is collaboration, and E is, is, is power. So empower, I talk about empower, is about empowering others, empowering others by your servitude, empowering others and your family to support them, empowering yourself through education, through uh, the digital channel. There's a multitude, there's so many online programs at the moment, and there's many free ones at the moment, uh, and there's also YouTube, because YouTube, you find, you find a lot of um, a lot of learnings on YouTube. So, comparing yourself through education, through knowledge, and we know the saying by by Nelson Mandela that, you know, education is a most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. So, comparing yourself through education, through learning, um, and also using the other things I mentioned about, about collaboration with others and adaptability. So, those are my final three things, uh, adaptability, Collaboration and um. brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I've, I've I've been making notes here on the in the office uh, as you've been speaking, uh, but I think those three elements, as simple as they are, have so much depth, right? So mm. as, as you say, you know, adaptability, that ability to to, to bounce, to re, to be resilient, to see an mm. opportunity and change, and I think for our uh, for our migrant community, uh, I think that's a really big thing because it's imbued in us, realistically, to be able to uh, adapt. We have to adapt. We don't have any opportunity, to, uh, you know, not to. And collaboration, we must have uh, communities. We must have a community. We know no man is an island. We're not going to, you know, not going to get anywhere. There's a lovely, a lovely phrase that goes with that, which is, uh, none of us are as smart as all of us. And that whole concept is, is we, we, if we only go by what we know, we're not going to get very far at all. But if we can use the, the skills and the abilities and resources that are around us, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and yeah, the empowerment factor is, is if we can, not only empowering ourselves, but by sheer uh, power of empowering other people gives us more power as well it's like that sharing aspect and so we began this whole session talking about you know servant leadership it's really mm. about going what can i do not what i can not not what can i get but what can i do and how can i have an impact for those uh, around me and in that process we'll have an impact on ourselves i have to say Filippo, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here uh, in the studio. I thank you so much for uh, uh, allowing me to uh, have you on the show and to pick your brains. And, um, and it's, I, I'm, yeah, extremely gratified indeed. So thank you so much. It's, uh, I, I'm very, very grateful. 
Um, and I'm sure that uh, our audience will have uh, gained a great deal of insight as well. So thank you very, very much indeed. All the very best for uh, the immediate future. And I'm looking forward to, um, uh, well, take one of your words, actually, further collaboration. That's been awesome, Greg. Uh, uh, I mean, look, if, you, uh, if you want to see about my other things I do, uh, you can get to my website, uh, philippolevy.com. So F-I-L-I-P-O-L-E-V-I.com. So you can, free, you can find a few of my articles and, um, and, uh, and blogs in there. You can read about what I do. Uh, but before I finish, I'd like to finish off this um, just, to, just to sort of bind everything together. Uh, one thought. So I'm just, it's not my quote, but it's a quote that I really like. So I'll say it now. So in times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after the world as if we were one single That's by King Tichila. Uh, Black Panther. Filippo, kia ora. Thank you very, very much indeed. Absolute pleasure. And I look forward to uh, catching you in, uh, in the very near future. All the very, very best. Yes, thank you. Well, what an absolutely fantastic uh, time we've just had here with uh, Filippo Levy. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm energized. Uh, I'm feeling empowered. I'm interested in collaborating and uh, looking for my own adaptability right now. Uh, and I hope that you are as well. Um, please do join us next week as we move to the third episode of this, uh, Moments That Matter, uh, brought to you by the Waitakere Ethnic Board, uh, because uh, we have another fantastic speaker who will be joining us. And this is uh, Dani Rios. Uh, she joins us uh, from uh, Argentina. She's actually uh, not joining us from Argentina. She's here in New Zealand, um, but uh, she is of um, Argentinian heritage. Uh, she's a coach, she's a speaker, she's an author, and has a fabulous book out, which is Mindful Empathy. And I'm very much looking forward indeed to uh, discussing elements of empathy about mindset, wellness, resilience uh, with uh, uh, Danny as well. So please do join us next Wednesday, the 18th of November at 10 a.m., as we bring you the third in our series of this the uh, uh, moments that matter with the Waitakere Ethnic Board. My name's Greg Ward. It's been my absolute pleasure to host this show and we will be seeing you in the very near future indeed. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a fantastic week. See you then. <laughs>